So I think the the best way to you know sum up being a Secret Service agent, it's prolonged periods of boredom only broken up by moments of sheer terror. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jonathan Wackrow, and I'm a former United States Secret Service agent. I spent 14 years in the agency and four and a half years assigned to the Presidential Protection Division during the Obama administration. Today we will be reviewing scenes featuring the President's Secret Service detail in TV and film. This is Air Force One, directed by Wolfgang Peterson. Seeing Air Force One in person for the very first time is very majestic, it literally takes your breath away. The entire construct around the plane has a different sense of importance than your regular aircraft. They actually represent it and capture the moment very well. The reason why the plane has such distinctive markings and is so obvious is because of the mission that it serves. The Secret Service understands security concerns that go along with it, and it's built into the overarching security plan. Gentlemen, welcome to Air Force One. Please present your equipment for inspection. We would have just inspected at the gate. Sir, this plane carries the President of the United States, although I we... I understand. That opens so. Yeah, partially. Please place your thumb on the ID pad. Looking at the boarding procedures, what they got right is uh, the organized structure. There are uh, a lot of moving parts around Air Force One just prior to departure, uh, but it's, it's not chaotic, it's very organized. What is off on this is actually who does it. The Secret Service does not protect the plane itself. That's a responsibility that falls upon the Air Force. The Secret Service is responsible for the overall security of the airport site. As we saw on the clip, one of the passengers put their thumb on an ID pad uh, to gain access. This was actually cutting edge at that time. Since then, technology has evolved and has expanded the level of access control to further protect that plane. Hello there, I'm Melanie Mitchell, Deputy Press Secretary. I'll be taking you in from here. Oh, Ms. Mitchell, it's so nice to finally meet you in person. The President and I were delighted we could accommodate your news crew. So in my experience, I never want to say never, but I think it's highly unlikely that you would see a foreign news crew absent of a foreign head of state on the aircraft at the same time that the president is on board. If you'd like, I think we have time for a quick tour. The press do reside in the back of the aircraft, and there is a separate cabin for Secret Service and the security detail. Cabin Secret Service, right here. They'll never try to go past them without an escort. I'm going to be very sorry. Hello. Hi. Moving forward in the aircraft, you get into staff, senior staff, and then the, the president's cabin. We could run the whole country from here, or even a war if we had to. What is uh, a little anomalous here is the fact that so close to the president's arrival, White House staff would be showing foreign press around. Yes. The president's arriving. They should all take their seats right away. I'll get out of here and let you all get some sleep. The president is essentially going to be one of the last people on the plane, and when he gets on, that door shuts and that plane moves. Mr. President, welcome aboard, sir. I was stunned at how fast the, the plane took off during my first trip. I was actually still standing and we were rolling down the runway. You don't want that aircraft to become a target on the ground. So the point is, once the President is on board that aircraft, it is moving immediately. Mr. President. Mr. President. Change in plan, Danny. Go to Barbados. <laughs> Anything you want, you're the president. My very first time aboard Air Force One, the moment that I got on board, you just knew that it was a different aircraft. The flight crew was different. You knew that this wasn't just a, a flight crew from Delta. These were trained professionals that were there to serve the president of the United States. And the food was fantastic. Skipping ahead in the movie, we see an agent assigned to the president's detail actually revealing himself as a rogue agent. The look of the Secret Service agent portrayed in the film is spot on. You always have your jacket on, tie on. You never know when you may confront either senior staff or the president, so you want to have a professional appearance at all times. The only change that you may actually have is a change in jacket. Sort of the rule of thumb, though, is if the president is not wearing a jacket, 
you're not going to wear a jacket. We want to blend into the environment as much as possible, so uh, it's easier just to mimic what the president is doing at that moment. We also see the rogue agent accessing a, a cache of weapons behind a, a security wall. What I can say is that uh, this type of weapon system or armament on board the aircraft would be safeguarded by an agent at all times. Beyond that, there's really not much more that I would want to talk about. I only will talk about things that are already out there in the public domain. This is Dave, directed yeah. by Ivan Reichman. In this scene, we see Dave, the president's decoy, talking to a member of the president's detail. How long has that been going on? I can't say. You mean you don't know, or you can't say? I can't say. At the White House, uh, the president has access to his own private kitchen within the residence, uh, as we see here. But then also, uh, the presidential food service. The quick answer is the president can get anything he wants at any time. The Secret Service tends to try to give as much privacy as possible to the president while he's in the, the residence. So while we know where he is at all times, it may not be representative like this scene here where an agent is standing next to the president while they're making their meal. So uh, your job is to protect the president all the time. That's, that's your whole job, right? Yes. The president's day is bifurcated into official duties and private time. So while the president may be in a relaxed demeanor, you still have to remain on point and focused on your job at hand. And that's why in this scene, we see the, that Secret Service agent maintaining his decorum throughout the entire scene. He's staying professional and focused on what he needs to do. If the president was to ever sit down and, and offer you food, uh, most agents that I know would re respectfully decline. You have a gun? Yes. You ever use it? Not yet. Uh, very common question to get. I thought the agent's response was a little bit cute, which he said, not yet, indicating that Dave was you know, starting to encroach on some, uh, some questions that that agent didn't want to answer. If this was the president, the actual president, um, asking questions, you have to answer them truthfully. Uh, but again, you have to understand what is the context of the questioning. Even though we have top secret clearance, you actually can't divulge things, even to the president, that are compartmentalized information. You know, I've always wondered about you guys. The way they say that you'd take a bullet for the president. What about it? Is that really true? I mean, would you let yourself be killed to save his life? Certainly. That means now you'd get killed for me, too. They're protecting the office of the presidency. So it's something greater than the individual. And I think that's the point that the agent at the very end realized, that this isn't about protecting Dave the decoy or stopping a bullet for Dave the decoy. This is about the sanctity and protecting the office of the presidency. This film is Angel Has Fallen, directed by Rick Roman Waugh. We see the president being attacked by drones while he is fishing on a lake. So every president is going to have their own hobbies, and each one of those hobbies is going to present a, a very unique challenge for the Secret Service. It doesn't matter what the activity is, you have to build that methodology around it. <laughs> We see the president with one Secret Service agent in a single boat in the middle of the lake. This is something that's really anomalous you wouldn't see. You would have the president with the security detail on one boat, but then you'd also have a, a chase boat with, with additional detail members on it, uh, as well as military and medical personnel. Again, you're taking that environment that's established around the president and just putting it onto the water. You. One of the reasons why I, I, I actually like this scene is because it actually represents a, a bona fide threat. 
Uh, we have seen recently occurrences uh, overseas in Syria where drones have been utilized and, and weaponized to attack over the horizon. So this, this scene really does represent what a potential threat could be. There's a lot of technologies that uh, are emerging today in addition to drones that, that really worry not only the Secret Service, but law enforcement in general. If you think about utilizing AI, machine learning, um, anything with deep fakes, videos, how do you create disinformation, how do you tap into communication systems. You're coming at your mark! Get him in the water! The heart covered is enough! What about you? What's wrong with it is the fact that that type of attack could even occur. The Secret Service controls the environment that they operate in. What the viewer sees is the president in the lake in the Secret Service on the shoreline. Um, that's actually not how protection works. It's a concentric ring of protection that goes out from the protectee. And why that's important for this scene is that the drones you know, came from a launcher. And the launcher was, was in, in fairly close proximity to the site of the president. That would have been picked up by the Secret Service. And so when you think about a methodology and why it's so successful, it's because it's systematic. And it, and it constantly proves itself correct time and time again, even with emerging technologies such as this drone attack. Hey, Diana, where's Megan? She's with Mr. Sanji. This is Along Came a Spider, directed by Lee Tamahori. In this scene, we see the president's daughter kidnapped while she's at school. Control, I'm en route to Sanji's classroom. One of the agents speaking back to the command post, which I think they called the control, the microphone's actually connected to the watch. So anytime you see uh, a Secret Service agent speaking into their wrist or their jacket, or even sometimes you'll see them uh, putting their finger to their ear, it's all part of the communication device. So it's wherever the microphone is most comfortable. Mr. Sanji, Secret Service, open up. Mr. Sanji! Do you have a key? There's a lot that, that is wrong. First and foremost, the fact that a protectee is so far away from the Secret Service is never going to happen. Second of all, the fact that a protectee is behind a locked door that the Secret Service doesn't have access to. Third, and I think the most egregious thing is you'll never have a Secret Service agent ask somebody, hey, have you seen where my protectee is? Um, I think that that is grounds for termination almost immediately. There's a big difference between a security structure that's set, set up for the president and one that's set up for the president's children, especially younger children that may be in school. But the, the protective methodology doesn't change. Control shut down, stop all vehicles, lock on Sanji and Rose. So in modern times, this is a threat, but Secret Service has spent a considerable amount of time planning for these scenarios. So whether it was the, the Bush girls going to college, Sasha and Malia being able to go to school in Washington, D.C., you build a a structure that blends into the school environment where you're still protecting that individual 360 degrees in all directions at all times. Here we saw a complete departure from that. How do you control the anxiety of a child, of the president, so that they're not always fearful that they're going to be kidnapped or harmed? And actually what you have to do is tell them about those threats have a little bit more transparency with them so that they understand and are reassured that even though there are these threats out there, you are there and the security structure is there and the process is there to, to mitigate that. We will have a procession and I will walk to the cathedral with the casket. This is Jackie, directed by Pablo Lorraine. Even if we could resume the arrangements, I'm sure you can understand the Secret Service still has their concerns. I'm President Johnson. President Johnson would like nothing more than to fulfill your wishes, but I have to take into account his safety. In this scene, we see former First Lady Jackie Kennedy discussing security details before the funeral of then-President John F. Kennedy. Him, he would do anything that might bring you comfort. And who is it up to, Mr. Valenti? 
Oftentimes it's said that Secret Service policies are born out of blood, and the tragic loss of John F. Kennedy is a clear example of that. Agents learn uh, very early on in their training about the different failures that uh, occurred on that day, and for that reason we see the President constantly traveling in not only a, a closed-top vehicle, but now that vehicle is completely and fully armored. Well, as I'm sure you know, tomorrow we're expecting close to 100 heads of state. 103. Yes, I'm sure that's right, and I suspect they'll make all their own decisions. Based on what? There's a great deal of classified intelligence that I just can't get into. We've intercepted a threat against General de Gaulle from our assets in Geneva. I'm afraid if he refuses to march, others may follow. The question is, what is the balance of exposure and security? And there's always a fine balance between the two. In this instance, the First Lady felt that it was necessary to bring closure uh, to this traumatic situation for her to walk with the casket. Obviously that represents a significant security challenge, but the Secret Service doesn't dictate the behavior of the protectees. We build a security structure around that behavior. So typically there's no final call made by one individual to dictate a security procedure. Uh, what it is, it's both sides coming to an agreement. If it was up to the White House staff, they would have the president standing in the middle of a crowd of 100,000 people with everybody around him. If it was up to the Secret Service, we'd have the president in a big steel box with a little vent for air. There's a, there's a big difference, and how do, we, how do we come to an agreement? Well, that's negotiation. Mr. Valenti, would you mind getting a message to all our funeral guests when they land? Of course. Inform them that I will walk with Jack tomorrow alone if necessary, and tell General de Gaulle that if he wishes to ride in an armored car or in a tank for that matter, I won't blame him. I and I'm sure the tens of millions of people watching won't either. Why are you doing this, Mrs. Kennedy? Oh, I'm just doing my job. So as we know, historically, the former First Lady did walk in the funeral procession publicly outside. I think in this instance, the First Lady was smart. She stuck to her own convictions. She knew what was best for not only her, her children, but the nation as it tried to heal. This is The American President, directed by Rob Reiner. Here we see the President of the United States requesting an impromptu stop at a flower shop. Look, look, there it is, Karma's House of Flowers. Hey, Coop, we gotta stop. What? I gotta get her some flowers. Here? Now? Well, that's what men do when they break a date. That's not what men do. I know no men who do that. Hey, Coop, I'm gonna hop out at the flower shop. You gonna hop out, sir? No, he's not hopping. No, no hopping, sir. The president would often call his agents by their name. In this instance, uh, Colin Coop is, is, a, is a good representation of, of, of that relationship. The lead agent is the head of the detail, so the, the entire structure builds out from, from that one individual. The detail leader would, would be traveling directly with the president. Stay in the car, I'll get the flowers. Then it's not going to be personal. There's a, a very large motorcade, and the question always arises, how many vehicles are in, in that motorcade? It varies. It varies upon location. Actually, in Washington, D.C., you're going to see probably one of the smallest motorcades, where if the president's traveling to uh, a campaign stop, that motorcade could expand out you know, significantly. Let's do a security sweep. We don't know who's in there. You think there's a florist in there planning an assassination on the off chance I might be stopping by? possible. The president says, you know, what are the odds of somebody, you know, launching an attack in that flower shop? I give him partial credit for that. However, you don't know what's on the other side of that door. So that could be somebody that hates the president, that has great animosity, that is engaged in criminal activity. You just don't know. So eliminating the unknown is something that is critical for the Secret Service. Excuse me. No, girl, at the game, I'm telling you, Kiki wasn't even there. Excuse me? <laughs> Hold on. I will be right with you. Hey, I don't know if you're the one that I talked to on the phone. Virginia, Dogwood, president. Does any of this ring a... So at the time that this movie was made, uh, which was really pre-9-11, uh, there is a, a likelihood that this could have occurred. In today's environment, um, what you see here is what's referred to as an off-the-record movement. These types of things rarely occur, if any. I have never experienced a true off-the-record movement which was not choreographed. 
Um, again, the threat environment is, is such that you can't take uh, any chances and you have to control every environment that the president goes into. This is an episode of Veep, directed by Tristam Shapiro. I think we should just go for it. I think we should just find the fuckers so the fuckers aren't fine. <laughs> This is a great scene. I love it because it, it does represent uh, the shock sometimes that uh, protectees have to realize that Secret Service agents are actually human. Uh, they have some sort of emotion. I think that the vice president's reaction here is a little bit overboard. I've seen the president make a joke uh, and agents laugh. Uh, I've actually laughed at, at something the first lady said and then in turn they started teasing me about something, so as long as it's something that's measured that doesn't have a material impact on the moment, then I think it's appropriate. That was totally inappropriate. 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 And that's not the first time that that's happened, by the way. Mm. He's not supposed to register emotion. He's supposed to be like a robot geisha. I have heard Secret Service agents be described in many different ways, uh, never as a robot geisha. Uh, so that, uh, that actually is a, is a first. You may find this surprising, but I actually think that Veep really represents the organized, I don't want to say chaos, but a structure that is um, a hurry-up offense constantly for, for any administration. A great representation of the security structure that I've discussed today can actually be seen during the upcoming inauguration. During the inaugural parade, you can actually see many layers of the concentric rings of protection. There's a lot of things that you will see, and there's a lot more things that you will not see. I challenge you to take a look and see how many you can identify.